true that uh, I am proud of my DC public school background, and it, I, I like to have that known so that when I make all the grammatical mistakes, <laughs> understandable. But uh, but also most importantly, everything I learned about international relations, I learned on the blacktop of uh, DC public schools. <laughs> everything about war and peace um, that I know. Um, uh, as far as theory and uh, learning at the at, at, at the foot of the grades, um, both uh, John Mearsham and Steve Walt, um, who some of you may know from his foreign policy blog, uh, Kennedy School professor of international relations, um, they, I would say both of them were my uh, uh, major mentors. And actually, I think um, if I have any kind of vision coming in as director of SSP, it's essentially that you know our job is to use um, rigorous theory and analysis to make sense of real world policy problems. And that that link between theory and policy is inextricable, it's meaningless, it's a false dichotomy to separate the two. And that's something I learned from Mearsheimer and from Walt kind of at an early age. So it's pretty obvious that it's guided uh, uh, my work since. Um, this, uh, well, the reason I want to present the article today is it's gotten, um, in, in particular, is a good example of what I kind of, uh, what I try to do my, in my class in SSB, in my, my elective on nuclear weapons, which is to kind of take theory, technological uh, uh, detail, analysis uh, of um, uh, technology and uh, military change, and then link it to, again, real world policy problems. In this case, the problem of deterrence and stability, um, the future of the US nuclear arsenal. And th this article, which is now, again, humble, not, not, this isn't a humble brag, this is just a brag. The, uh, <laughs> the article is, is number one on the inter most downloaded international security article uh, list, um, uh, sort of running 12 month period, but it's only came out in the spring, so you know, we're well ahead of pace. And I think it's got something like 10,000 full text downloads. I think the reason for that is because it both taps into, as you'll see, the uh, North Korea um, uh, situ situation on the North Korean Peninsula um, uh, situation, and it also um, taps into the nuclear posture review, which is underway at the Pentagon right now. Um, and so we've, um, in the places we've gone and discussed this, both within the US government and elsewhere, um, we try and link it up to uh, U.S. force posture changes and thinking, and apparently it's gotten some some purchase across the pond there. Um, the question that uh, we're asking is, um, you know, how does technology how is technology affecting nuclear deterrence and nuclear stability? And my co-author Daryl Press um, is on here because pretty much everything we've done on nukes has been collaborative uh, uh, for quite a while now. And here's the uh, here's the punchline: um, technology is undermining the vulnerability of nuclear forces. Right? Long-term technological trends rooted in the computer revolution are incre increasing the vulnerability of nuclear forces. What do we mean by trends? First of all, um, the great leaps in weapons accuracy. Most people are familiar with the advances at the level of con conventional munitions, precision guided munitions, etc. But also nuclear weapons have become more accurate. And that's having a great impact on the vulnerability of existing nuclear forces. The second big component of this is the revolution of remote sensing. The ability to peer into an adversary's backyard and find things that are moving, <coughs> find fixed targets, um, and of course have the ability then to destroy them. And both of those advances are made possible by, and are only, only useful if you have that information, for example, about remote sensing, is if you can process it through so data processing and communicate it to uh, leaders and military commanders in the field to be able to capitalize on it. Um, again, a lot of these developments are familiar. Not all of them, but a lot of them are. Um, uh, but I think it's fair to say there's been little attention to the cumulative consequences of these changes. You take, pull out to 35,000 feet, what does this mean? And if we think about the consequences, what we need to do is re revisit foundational assumptions about nuclear weapons. Um, you know, Tom is old enough, and even I'm old enough to remember uh, the Cold War and everything we learned about nuclear weapons in the Cold War is it, still pretty much the conventional wisdom today that when it comes to survivability of nuclear weapons, it's really not that difficult of a challenge, right? You know, you have subs out in the ocean, you have road, road mobile missiles, uh, um, uh, uh, roaming terrain, fixed 
hardened, reinforced silos to put your, your, your missiles in. This is really not a huge issue. Again, the United States and Soviet Union appear to be very concerned about it during the Cold War, but everyone kind of knows it's not that hard to keep your forces secure. Another conventional wisdom, is, and relatedly, is that counter force. Launching an attack, a conventional or nuclear attack, to disarm your adversary of its nuclear weapons is basically impossible. This was certainly true after about the mid-60s of the Cold War, through the end of the Cold War, many believe, when, you, when analysts tried as best they could on paper, on fancy computers, to model a first strike. And, you know, the remaining weapons that survived were more than enough to kind of be used in retaliation and render a counterforce strategy um, irrational and insane, suicidal. I think both of those assumptions need to be revisited if what we're saying is true. And if you believe that, if that's the conclusion, then you have good reasons to be concerned about how robust nuclear deterrence really is. There are both risks and opportunities in the analysis here, right? Um, first of all, risks to strategic stability. If it's true that nuclear arsenals are getting more vulnerable, we should anticipate for strike incentives that two adversaries that are armed with nuclear weapons and fear that the other side might launch a counterforce strike in a dark times under crisis might have a greater incentive to use their nuclear weapons first before they're eliminated by an adversary strike. Again, we worried deeply about this during the Cold War. Second concern would be about arms racing. You try to arms race your way out of vulnerability. If your arsenal is vulnerable, build more. Build a different kinds of nuclear weapons, et cetera, and that might trigger arms races. And then a third uh, category would just be political instability, a spiraling of, of hostility and tensions. If, say, the United States and China understand the counterforce revolution and begin to try and address it, um, that can have some pretty negative effects. On the other hand, and it's not polite to say, but there might be opportunities in this, particularly for a country like the United States, which is at the vanguard of technological advances having to do with the counterforce revolution. So first of all, it's not only an opportunity, we kind of need to make these decisions now as we're modernizing the nuclear arsenal. So it's supposed to last for the next 50, you know, 60 years. Um, you might want to make some choices about developing and deploying weapons that bolster your counterforce capability and both protect your nuclear arsenal from attack. Just as vulnerability of nuclear forces might undermine deterrence, it might bolster deterrence. It might make your threat to use nuclear weapons more credible. Say against a country like North Korea, if you tell North Korea, you reach for your nuclear weapons, we're going to disarm you. Just in theory, having the ability, actual ability to do that, a credible ability to do that, might have some deterrent uh, impact. I'm pretty pessimistic about the nuclear peninsula for, for other reasons, other dynamics of uh, nuclear escalation. But uh, um, deterrence might be closer, and your allies might have greater assurance that your nuclear umbrella will protect them. And there's a third category, again, people usually don't like to talk about, which is if we actually have to use nuclear weapons in dark times. North Korea, uh, we're finding a conventional war with North Korea, and it begins to escalate. And it uses a nuclear weapon and threatens to use 10 more unless we stop the conventional conflict. A U.S. president might have to order a disarming strike, a counterforce strike. And in that case, it would be useful to have the kinds of capabilities that are most effective for counterforce strikes. Risks and opportunities, and again, we don't clearly come out you know, one side or the other. Again, I think people tend to ignore the possible opportunities, so I like to emphasize that. It gets people a little more roused up. All right, take a step back. Think about what survivability actually means in the nuclear age. Right? It, from the beginning, there have been essentially three ways to protect your arsenal from uh, disarming attacks. The first kind of strategy is hardening, right? Hardening means, you know, putting your missiles in, in reinforced concrete, uh, 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 metal reinforced concrete silos made to withstand, and, you know, up to 3,000 pounds per square inch of overpressure from a nuclear weapon, uh, very strong kind of protected silos. You can do the same thing to some extent with storage sites for nuclear weapons and even build hardened aircraft shelters. You can't quite get them to be 3,000 uh, PSI, but that's the strategy. We're going to you know where the, our targets are, but you're going to try and hit them. You're not going to be able to destroy them. Second strategy is concealment, which doesn't just mean putting up some camouflage over you know, a warhead sitting out in the open. Of course, it does not mean that. What it means is really about mobility uh, more than anything, being able to conceal your missiles by moving them around, hiding them from 
your adversary. The same goes, of course, for submarines at sea, you know, vast ocean in which to hide in. Um, that's more about concealment. Submarines at sea are incredibly vulnerable if found. A conventional torpedo can sink a nuclear, you know, a nuclear submarine uh, fairly easily. Mobile missiles as well. Three, I think you know, three to five psi um, is enough to kind of flip a, a, a mobile tail. Um, so the idea is to not be found. Um, and of course, you can also build decoys, which in a way is a form of concealment. And the third strategy for protecting your arsenal is redundancy. Build more. Build larger arsenals, more diverse arsenals, a full triad of <coughs> land-based missiles, fixed silos, mobile missiles, submarines at sea. Right. So redundancy through diversity is also an option. And the United States, for example, has done all three of these things. Clearly, your technological sophistication determines whether or not you can do all this and do it well. Our argument is that the accuracy revolution and the sensing revolution are directly undermining two of the three pillars, the two of the three core strategies for survivability. Accuracy is making fixed targets um, irrational, implausible, extremely difficult as a strategy for protecting your arsenals, again, especially against a sophisticated adversary. And the remote sensing revolution is undermining concealment as a strategy. Uh, for my arms control friends, I like to throw in the third factor, which is that arms cuts, uh, in a way, undermine the final pillar of stability by reducing the size of arsenals. If you reduce the size of an arsenal, that's fewer targets for an adversary to try and hit. So you take all this together, and survivability is getting challenging for everyone, including the United States. Now, it's obviously not equally, not equally for all states. A country like North Korea faces a huge dilemma compared to the United States, and the United States is much better off even than a country like China. But for everyone, it's getting harder. And the question is, is it getting harder in any, any meaningful way, any significant way that really matters? Let me um, spend a little bit of time on, on this slide because I think uh, this basically depicts all of the changes that we'll talk about. I'll focus in the, in the remaining slides on just a few of these things. Um, first of all, when it comes to accuracy, the biggest change has been increased PK, probability of kill. The ability to take a warhead missile bomb and center, put it on a target, destroy a hardened fixed target in particular. Um, we've seen a dramatic increase in that. I'll, I'll, I'll illustrate that with a couple slides that follow. There are a whole number of things, though, that follow on from the increased probability of kill, excuse me, follow on from the increased accuracy <coughs> of weapons and delivery systems, okay? Um, first of all, the fratricide problem. In the Cold War, it turned out military planners and targeters could generally only put two, maybe three uh, warheads on a single target, okay? The reason for that was the problem of fratricide. If one, if there was a target, fixed silo, and you sent in a warhead, and it detonated and it missed the target, if it hit the target, great. If it missed the target, it kicked up a bunch of dirt and debris in that mushroom cloud, it would essentially destroy any incoming subsequent warheads. They're coming in at mock the Jesus, they hit a small dust particle, and, and that's all she wrote. So typically what smart players did was plan to put one airburst above the target, not low enough to create fault, uh, create uh, the vacuuming up of debris, but enough to create overpressure, and then a second one, in case that one didn't work, that was going to be a ground burst, and that was pretty much going to be it. The fratricide revolution, excuse me, the accuracy revolution has solved the problem of fratricide. I'll try and, I, I have some backup slides, we can go in if anybody really wants to get into the, the weeds of it, but the explanation for that is essentially now, if a warhead makes it to the target, if it doesn't fail on the launch pad or doesn't you know, fail to separate from the bus in space, if it gets there, it's going to destroy the target. It's not the near miss category, which is the real cause of fracture has essentially been eliminated with the most accurate weapon. So now four, five, six warheads on a single target. Again, you may think that's overkill, these are 455 kiloton weapons, but we have smaller weapons, again, different scenarios where that might very well, very well be necessary. Revolutionized role of submarines. Um, boomers in the Cold War were primarily useful only as retaliatory kinds of delivery systems, and, and against, only against cities. In other words, the submarines that we had that had nuclear weapons for the bulk of the Cold War, their target set was just a bunch of Russian cities because they weren't accurate enough to be used in a counterforce role. 
And the reason they weren't accurate enough is that they couldn't precisely fix their location in the ocean in order to understand, the tar give them the t to, to input the targeting, uh, the targets in a way that would give it great um, uh, accuracy. Uh, that's changed, of course, because now submarines can fix their location through GPS, at sea, and other navigational techniques much more precisely, and given the, that they can get closer to the targets, um, the, uh, uh, the difference in uh, probability of kill and accuracy has changed dramatically. So what's happened is submarines are now potent counterforce weapons. And if a submarine has 140 uh, uh, warhead, warheads on it, all of a sudden that dramatically increases the number of weapons that you can use, the number of shooters, compared to the number of targets. Everyone, I think, uh, appreciates the increased uh, accuracy of conventional weapons. And in the nuclear domain, this matters for a couple different reasons. One is that that adds to the number of shooters that you can use. If you can destroy a nuclear target with a conventional munition, then you've dramatically increased the number of shooters that you have. And secondly, you now face the possibility of lower fatalities in such an attack. Um, the other and final piece of the accuracy puzzle that is particularly important, and which I will try and illustrate for you, um, is the uh, greater effectiveness of air burst detonations um, against hardened targets, which res results in much lower fatalities. Okay? So remember, before when I said the warhead makes it to the target, detonates, vacuums up all this dust and debris, um, what happens with a ground burst like that is that it that material vaporizes, and as it rises, it begins to cool. And as it cools and begins to re-solidify, it mixes with fissile material, radioactive fissile material. And that is radioactive <coughs> fallout. That comes back down floating to the earth. It's the big killer. When you talk about nuclear weapons killing people, it's nuclear fallout, which then has the potential, depending on the location, depending on the wind pattern, depending on demographics, to, to kill millions of people, not just at the site of, of the blast. However, you sound like fuck churches in here a little bit. However, if you detonate a nuclear weapon, depending on its yield, you can calculate this pretty easily, uh, how high it needs to be above the target in order to not create fallout. In other words, if the fireball doesn't touch the ground and doesn't suck up that vapor, it's not going to create fallout. It's going to kill everything on the ground directly below within the lethal radius, but it's not going to create fallout. And the trick is, can you detonate something that destroys the target, creates enough overpressure to destroy it without creating fallout? And the answer is, in the age of accuracy, you can. And we model that and demonstrate that. And the consequences for fatality, the difference in fatalities, is tremendous. Again, I'm not just talking about millions versus you know, half a million or something. I'll show you. It's, it's dramatically less than that. So all of these effects flow from increased accuracy, and I'll primarily demonstrate the increased BK itself and, um, and a little bit on lower fatalities. A couple other things. Um, rapid reprogramming doesn't easily fit into the accuracy revolution or the remote sensing revolution, but it's a, it's a small, it seems like a small change, but uh, it has a big impact on counterforce. And that's simply the ability in the computer age to, um, uh, uh, to compensate for missiles that never make it to the target or fail early in a launch. So when a missile comes out of a silo, oh, there are a bunch of things that can go wrong. The silo cap may not open up, it might not fire, it might, as it's getting off the launch pad, it might fail in dramatic fashion. Again, once it gets up into space, the warhead may not separate from the bus. <coughs> a lot of things that can go wrong, right? Early in a launch, the key is, can you take the target coordinates of that weapon and send them, assign them to a second uh, warhead in another, uh, uh, on another shooter? And the answer is, yes, we can do that. Does the United States currently do that? I don't know. It's classified information, but we have the capability and there are good reasons to believe that we, that, um, we do have that ability. And then finally, the remote sensing revolution um, is, is just stunning um, when you think about the increase, compared, now compared to in the Cold War, the increased diversity of sensor platforms, the kinds of different sensors we have, the, the kinds of different sensors from optical satellites to um, uh, radar uh, satellites, to synthetic aperture, um, uh, all kinds of different kinds of sensors, spectroscopy, etc. The persistence of those sensing <coughs> platforms, right? In the old days, uh, 
satellite comes over Soviet territory, takes some pictures, right? And once it's got the whole roll going, because you don't want to just stop at 34 pictures, you need the whole 36. Mm -hmm takes the roll, puts it in the canister, ejects it in this back in space to float down to the earth. Plane comes by with a hook, grabs the parachute out of the air, takes it back down to the base, takes it to the Pentagon, film's developed, the analysis is done, right? And then you got, you got a few snapshots of something that you know, happened two weeks ago, okay? Now we have the ability to, to loiter over targets depending on the platform. Resolution, right, Le resolution, you can tell a truck from a, you know, a, a, a car from a, Military vehicle. Now we're talking down to down to inches. Again, what, whatever the commercial satellite resolution of the best satellites is basically about four inches, six inches um, uh, uh, resolution. It's 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 a stunning change. The ability to process all that data, the signals, and again to communicate it to leaders is pretty stunning. And I'll I'll try to show what we try to do is show one way to analyze that in a coherent fashion. Okay, what is increased? probability of kill. What do we do here? First of all, we use formulas that nuclear analysts have used for, for decades. Okay? Um, you, know, you can buy a book, you know, The Effects of Nuclear Weapons, a DOD publication you know, that was declassified and released, which talked all about, you know, all those tests that we did, they kind of came to some fruition because then we had a lot of data and we could now have formulas to figure out things like the lethal radius, lethal radius, the single shot kill probability, the terminal kill probability, and that's really PK here. Um, what do we have going on here? What we have is ICBMs and SLBMs, sea launch ballistic missiles and intercontinental ballistic missiles. These are the ones in silos, these are the ones at sea. 1985 versus 2017. 1985 versus 2017 here, because there are two different kinds of warheads on the US SLBM force. The W76, which is a 335 kiloton warhead, and the W88, which is a 455 kiloton warhead. The, the ICBMs are both Minuteman 3s, right? The 1985 version of a Minuteman 3 and the 2017 version. This is a single use against a 3,000 PSI target. What's the likely result? In 1985, an ICBM had a 54% chance of uh, just hitting and destroying uh, a 3,000 PSI target, right? It had this chunk of percentage as a likely miss and 20% fail. The fail is the reliability issue. In other words, that's the same across the board because analysts use an 80%, 20% reli um, unreliability, 80% reliability figure. All that simply means is you take 10 of that type of warhead, the missile, bomb, etc., and use it, it's going to fail 2 out of 10 times. You do it 100 times, 10 of them are going to fail. The United States takes uh, the warhead out of a Minuteman 3 takes it over to Vandenberg Air Force Base every now and then, a couple times a year, launches it, you know, and, it, and it's supposed to fail 20% of the time, according to the analysis. Uh, that's problematic for a bunch of reasons. A very conservative assumption. We know that missiles will work better than that. But again, for, to be conservative in the analysis, we're just going to assume 2 out of 10 times that fails. You can see a pretty dramatic change to 2017. The upgraded guidance on the Minuteman 3 missiles has now shrunk that miss category. The near miss makes it to the target but doesn't destroy it, has shrunk down to roughly about 5% of the total outcome. And it's an even more dramatic change for SLBMs, where in the old days you had about a 9% chance of killing a fixed silo. Again, F boomers were not counterforce weapons in the Cold War. Now they are and essentially has eliminated entirely the near-miss um, uh, uh, category. Does that make sense? Well, let's model. What happens? That's a single use, a single shot effect. What if you're, in the real world, you're going after more than one weapon, right? I mean, you're certainly going to hit more than one target. And so what we did was we modeled a, a real counterforce strike, a hypothetical counterforce strike against a 200 target set. <coughs> Now, when we went to Beijing and to present this analysis, which we did, we also went to Moscow, we went to Korea, we went to a bunch of places. We did not have China there. We, I think we said like North Korea. The, the reality is actually both a North Korean target set and a you know, hypothetical Chinese target set might be roughly about 200. I mean, that's, we didn't just pull 200 out of a hat. We tried to count up silos, reinforced silos, mobile missiles, shelters, command and control sites. But again, that's just, you know, 200 is... Um, uh, um, not quite random, but if you want, we can vary that in, in different ways, and it wouldn't affect the analysis. 200 targets, that's a lot of targets. 
So in 1985, if you launched an attack using all Minuteman 3, W78, that's the warhead on, the, on Minuteman 3 in 1985, um, we know from open, all this is open source information uh, estimates that the circular error probable, the ac measure of accuracy that we use when it comes to weapons was 183 meters. And what that means is that with a, uh, a target within a circle with a 183 meter radius, right, half of the time the weapon will land within that radius of that circle and half the time it'll, it'll land outside of it. That's all it means. It's a measure of accuracy, 183 meters, which is pretty amazing compared to some of the earlier CEPs in the Cold War, which is like a mile, okay? Um, yield 335 kilotons. We're going to use that standard reliability figure of 0.8. We're going to use two warheads against us each, each target, right? 200 targets. We're going to use 400 weapons. The probability of kill of a, of a you know, each weapon is 0.79, Okay. The problem is, multiplied over the course of a 200 target set, you're going to have a surviving, 42 surviving, um, in, say, Chinese silos, Chinese missiles, okay? That, that's coded red because that is not a successful disarming strike. I mean, that's not just getting your hair must. That's like, you know, um, 42 Chinese weapons. Uh, let's just say they're armed with a megaton each and maybe MERV and all the rest. Um, that's a bad result, okay? That was 1985. And, and, and I should just say, people did the analysis in 1985 in open source <laughs> analysis using the same kind of formulas, and this is the, the result that they got, except when it was vis a vis the Soviet Union, there was hundreds and hundreds of surviving weapons. What about today? Just looking at the ICBM capability, whether we use the W78 uh, on the, uh, sorry, on the, on the Minuteman 3 ICBM, or at sea on the Trident 2, uh, a W88, we got CEP improvement to 120 meters and 90 on the W88. Uh, yield is larger on the submarine launch weapon. Same reliability, same two on one attack. Now all of a sudden your probability of kill is up to 90, 93%, 96%. And yet, for a 200 target set, that still leaves 13 and 8 surviving uh, targets, respectively. Okay, not, not a, that, is not a, that is not a revolutionary impact on counterforce targeting. But if we begin to relax some of those conservative assumptions, like reliability, um, and we, there are two things to go on this. First of all, uh, we did an analysis um, that's illustrated in the article of uh, Russian uh, sat satellite launches and their own tests of their own missiles and their own claims about the reliability of their own figures, um, and it's upwards of 95%, etc. So if the, I mean, I hate to... If the Russians can do it, maybe they can do it better, I don't know, but they've demonstrated they've done it better. Um, and moreover, when we presented this um, to a couple different audiences, um, both at one of the combatant commands that deals with nuclear weapons and at one of the uh, labs um, that builds nuclear weapons, it was strongly suggested that our open source figure was far too conservative for reliability. So we said, fine, we'll do 0.9%. That means only one out of 10 are going to fail. What do we get? 0.99% probability to kill two surviving warheads. That's starting to get interesting now. Two surviving targets, by the way. Maybe they're only a command and control post, but the point is let's even assume that's a silo with a missile in it. That's the outcome. Next, we stick with the realistic reliability and we incorporate reprogramming. So in the first few minutes of a launch, if there's a failure, those targets can be reassigned. You get up, you get almost 100%. And the result is zero surviving targets. If you s take away re uh, reprogramming and just add one more attacking warhead, you get three on one attack. Also, zero is the result here. Finally, something I haven't even talked about yet, the, um, there's been this thing called the uh, super fuse, the compensated fuse, super duper fuse, I don't know, whatever you want to call it, that the United States has put on all of its, uh, is putting on all of its W76 warheads to improve their um, uh, lethality. Um, and essentially what that does, and again, sorry, it's fun to talk about the technical details here. Um, if the target is here, and a warhead that's coming in on a ballistic trajectory can't steer itself. Okay? It's a ballistic trajectory. It's floating down to the earth. It's coming through the atmosphere and it's heading to the target. The one thing it does is preset to detonate at a certain height of burst. Okay? That might be very low for a ground burst, it might be high for an air burst. 
but none of that can be adjusted. It has a gyroscope, it understands, it has an altimeter, so it understands how high it is, it understands if it's off target, but it detonates at that preset altitude. What the compensated fuse does is allow the warhead to determine, both determine that it's off course and adjust the height of burst to compensate for accuracy, um, inaccuracy. And there are two different ways you would do that, right? If you're set to detonate here above the target and you're coming in low, you're going to wait longer and longer to detonate and low, detonate at a lower height of burst. That gets you closer to, the, to, the, to, to ground zero where you want to detonate, right? Because if it detonates at the height of burst over here, it's too far away from the target. Likewise, if it's going long, it will detonate itself earlier at a higher height of burst, in other words, to get as much overpressure directly above the target as possible. That has something like a 33% impact on accuracy, and again, if we incorporate reliability, um, a, a rapid reprogramming, then we're down to you know, zero, one uh, as a result. All right, look. Somebody presents stuff like this, I feel around for my wallet, make sure you know, <laughs> it's all there, uh, and what are we talking about here? Um, the, the bottom line is, there is no single silver bullet. It's not like I sleep well at night just because we've got the compensated fuse. But it's these series of steps that have transformed capabilities. Um, and that have significantly increased the vulnerability of hard fixed targets. Okay? Let me talk about the greater effectiveness of air bursts, in particular, their ability, but, which again is a product of the accuracy revolution, which then leads to lower fatalities. Again, I just like to do this because it's, it tends to provoke um, our allies have a deep interest in, in this kind of capability in particular, um, and I think it's just interesting. So, a few years ago, I guess a decade ago now, um, the NRDC did a study of a, of a, a counterforce, U.S. counterforce attack on a Chinese <coughs> fixed silos. You know, 20 fixed silos. And the result was, yeah, you could kill them, but you're going to kill millions and millions of people. Therefore, time for a change. That was the title of the, of the study. We need a different strategy. What we did was took the NRDC approach. We did the exact same thing for a notional North Korean target set. We just put five... Um, uh, uh, targets around North Korea to signify nuclear sites. We do not, we didn't place them in places that we thought. We just tried to spread them out, basically to create as much, you know, death and destruction as possible as an impact of the attack. What we wanted to do was destroy those five targets. We needed, we needed a PK that would be effective enough to destroy them. And what we did is we assigned 10 W88 warheads, fire, fire from submarines, 405 455 kilotons each, right? The good news is the targets were destroyed. The bad news is using DOD software called HPAC that was developed to kind of analyze uh, uh, <coughs> nuclear fallout risks from accidents and from, and from military use, we modeled the fallout over uh, the surrounding areas. And the result, if you feed in the demographics, it, you know, it takes into account time of year that you do the attack, the prevailing wind patterns, and it spits out you know, how many people die. And it's basically two to three million people dead, depending on what times of the year we run the, the attack. And it's not just in North Korea, but in South Korea. And as you can see, there's some levels of radiation that float over places like Hiroshima, which is again not, you know, and Japan, not exactly something that is um, appealing to, my, to our um, uh, Asian allies. Um, but that's not the only way to do it. That's the sledgehammer approach. You do the same attack using low yield options. Okay? In the United States Force, we currently have low yield options on air delivered weapons. That's the cruise missiles and the bombs dropped from uh, uh, B2s uh, and B-52s. Okay? On, the, on the bombs, the B-61 is the warhead. They have a dial a yield right, that goes as low as 0.3 kilotons. Right? There are a number of different presets, and it goes up to 150 kilotons. You know, and the joke in the Cold War is, yeah, well, we just didn't turn them all the way up to, what is it, spinal tap? You know, have it set to 11. Uh, you just, yeah, I didn't go halfway across the pond to have this thing go off at 0.3. But the point is, you could have it set at 0.3 kilotons. And the Alcoms have similarly low uh, uh, yields, the, the air launch cruise missiles. So we use 20 B-61s in, in order to be effective. So a four-on-one attack, less, less yield, you need more, you know, to increase PK. Effective enough to destroy the targets, 
with a result of less than 100 dead. In other words, just the personnel at these particular sites that we chose. Okay? Um, you could do, run a different, different models, different heights of burst, and that figure will change, but not dramatically. You're talking about less than 1,000 dead in, in almost every model of the attack that we ran. This is a significant difference. Again, it's just the conventional, it's not even wisdom, view is that you know, all nuclear weapons are the same. One goes off, it's you know, a bad day. And that's not the case. And a president, a U.S. president that faces these two options, those are real options. Right? And you're going to, people say that no, no president would ever agree to use a nuclear weapon. If North Korea used a nuclear weapon against a South Korean city or against a Japanese city and said that they got 10 more to use or 5 more to use, and a president sits down and gets this, of course they would choose this option if they had to make a choice. And having this option make them, might make them more likely and able to disarm the adversary. Okay, just a, a few. Uh, a few things on remote sensing. Um, how do you analyze remote sensing? This is really hard. It's one thing to kind of model an attack on, on a fixed silo, but how are you going to model, what, what kind of analysis can you do to show how this is, how this is really important? And what we did was we looked at a small subset of existing U.S. capabilities in the remote sensing realm. We have, sat we have all kinds of satellites. In particular, the most useful ones are, are, are radar satellites, synthetic aperture radar satellites. So we're not even looking at optical satellites and resolution, all that stuff. We are going to employ standoff uh, um, uh, UAVs um, uh, using uh, synthetic aperture radar also, and we're going to use penetrating um, UAVs um, to do. Those are the only capabilities that we're going to look at. We chose a case, North Korea, um, for obvious reasons. And again, right off the bat, I emphasize that uh, we we're not offering a point estimate here. Any of our analysis, not, there's so many different variables at work in this kind of campaign to go after a um, road mobile missiles in North Korea that to suggest that you know, we have a definitive answer is, is kind of crazy. Again, it's just to illustrate the emerging remote sensing capabilities so far. And the question we asked, the analysis that we undertook, was to say what percentage of North Korean roads that are usable by uh, tell. So um, a transporter, electric launcher. So the thing that carries around a mobile missile and then launches. It can't just go up, you know, a ravine. There are only certain kinds of roads that it can use, although there are quite a lot. Um, and I spent part of the summer, we spent part of the summer trying to figure this out. Believe it or not, there aren't great maps of, of North Korea um, that are available to us. Um, at one point we had to refer to a couple um, bicycle uh, enthusiast maps. It turns out they care a lot about terrain and, and, and that kind of thing. But anyways, we also use some other obvious open, open source uh, uh, maps to come up with this information. So what percentage of the roads are visible to satellites and UAVs? And then how frequently do those satellites get a look at those roads? That was the objective. <laughs> and we began with radar satellites. Um, they are, unlike optical satellites, they can see during the day, they can see at night, they can penetrate cloud cover. This is a, a picture, we, we don't have any U.S. government pictures of our own radar satellites, but this was released by the Russians, very helpful to show us. You know, there's a long antenna, these are floating through space. You can go um, uh, uh, on Wikipedia and find um, uh, you know, how many of these there are um, uh, around the world. Um, the big problem when we started this analysis was that apparently SAR satellites, synthetic aperture satellites, were um, thought to be blind to moving targets. Right? Um, again, I won't get into the physics of it, but uh, it was believed that if something's moving, then you can't see it. That's not very helpful if you're trying to find road mobile targets. You also have the problem of topography. North Korea is a pretty mountainous place, and you know, you're looking from an angle, and you Parts of the roads are going to be blocked from different angles. How, how do you figure that out? And then finally, these aren't, these aren't stationary over North Korea. They're moving. They're doing passes. Okay? What we found, first of all, most importantly, was that SAR satellites can image moving targets. Again, when we set out, we were told, this is a big problem. You can't do that. And we then consulted all kinds of papers, the Canadian traffic analysis uh, uh, efforts, although they were always associated with defense um, think tanks there, so it was a little strange. But... Uh, we, we looked at their work of real scientists, not fake scientists, um, uh, and, and figured out that of course they could image moving targets. And by moving targets, we mean truck size moving vehicles. This is a picture of, um, of Ottawa. Any Canadians here? 
No? They just don't want to admit it. It's typically great. <laughs> uh, uh, picture of Ottawa, Ottawa Trans uh, Canadian Highway, I think. Um, it, and the color codes tell you which direction it's moving, what speed it's moving, etc. Now, US, US and other SAR satellites can do this for a hundred, every time, 150 kilometer wide swath of the Earth's surface. Um, and that's important to us because it's a two hour drive time. A mobile missile that starts in the middle of a garrison can drive essentially two hours before it reaches the edge of that swath. Okay? Now, each time a satellite goes by, it takes a bunch of different swaths, really 150 by 150 kilometer boxes over and over again as it goes over. It's not just a single swath. It can image the entire country in a single, in a single pass. But there are other constraints. What about topography? What about intermittent coverage? So we, we tried to look at that issue. And I will not spend a lot of time on this, um, but what we tried to do is come up with a, a measure of a usable pass. A usable pass by a SAR satellite is something that gives you a 90% coverage of all North Korean roads um, uh, in, in a single pass. Okay? The problem is, you know, if you're, these are dots are actually coming at you, the satellite coming around the Earth's surface in LEO, um, right below the, sa the satellite's a nadir hole, you can't actually see what's right below you, so if you start at 100% from an angle, it goes out to 70%. Average coverage of 90%. That's one usable pass, and each satellite in low Earth orbit gives you two and a half usable passes a day. Okay? What do we do with that information? Well, we try to estimate the time that a mobile missile commander would have between passes, given the number of SAR satellites that the United States has, and given the number of satellites that its allies have. Right? You're a road mobile missile out there. You might be able to hide under an overpass, a concrete overpass. You might be able to hide in a shelter, right? But and you can cat, you can go online and look and see when these satellites are passing overhead. It's all right there. Uh, you give your, your your coordinates and and you can find that. Now again, if they're a bunch of mobile missile commanders accessing their laptops and using you know Wi-Fi out in the, in the uh, <laughs> that that poses all kinds of other problems. I'm guessing for um, um, their safety. <laughs> and survival. But in any event, let's say they know that, how frequently do they think they can move and evade detection? The United States, according to open sources, has six SAR satellites. That gives you 15 usable passes per day, and the analysis using the road network would be 91, no, 91 minutes between passes, given that information, right? We also have these things called allies. So if we assume in dark times that we're trying to observe North Korean roads, we might be able to press our allies in NATO to allow us to use um, their SAR satellites, and this is cumulative, right? So NATO doesn't have 15, right? It's got nine. You add those in, you add in Japan, you add in Israel. Again, plausible to assume that they would be cooperative in a case of escalation of nuclear use. And you get a total of 50 usable passes, 24 minutes between passes. Now, is 24 minutes, is that good news or bad news for a mobile missile commander? It sounds to me like pretty bad news. But again, we're not making a point estimate here. Um, we, might, we might be using commercial SAR satellites, right? We might have more SAR satellites, we might have less, doubtful. And we'll have all kinds of other capabilities. The point is 24 minutes already doesn't look that great, and we're not using optical satellites, we're not using infrared satellites, we're not using other sensing platforms like unattended ground sensors that you can spread over North Korea, near North Korean roads which can detect the particular acoustic signature of moving tails and then, and then cue U.S. Uh, um, uh, sensing platforms. Um, and again, so far I haven't even worked in the UAV issue yet. <coughs> Bottom line, very difficult challenge for the adversary. The last few slides here to illustrate what you can do with standoff SAR and penetrating, excuse me, uh, standoff UAVs and penetrating UAVs. So what we did is we took that same road network, we used ArcGIS to kind of do all this analysis, um, uh, our Q4s are Global Hawks, Global Hawk UAVs, drones, uh, JSTARS, EP3, other platforms that you can use. And what we did is we set four different locations, optimal locations, away from North Korean air defenses, right? So 80 kilometers offshore. They have a range of 240 kilometers in which they can see with their SAR satellites, standoff um, uh, ground moving target indicator systems. Um, and the yellow are the roads that you can see, the red are the roads you can't see. Now, when I first, this first came up on my screen, I thought, shit, you know, it doesn't look that good, right? I mean, it, it, it is excellent, but primarily just on the, around the coast. And peering deep inside, 
The North Koreans know this. They're obviously going to put their mobile missiles and deploy them in garrisons on in the interior of the country, but, but, but actually quite good when it comes to the exterior part. So what we also did was we evinced some penetrating UAVs, the Sentinel, RQ-170, maybe you can use RQ-180s. Uh, again, hard to some open source, pretty accurate information seemingly on their capabilities. Um, what these are are uh, circles where you have one and the area in which it can move, it can fly for five minutes in any direction, and given its ability to to, to see, it's with its sensors 50 kilometers beyond that. Um, this is the area in which it can move, and then the yellow is the areas that it can detect. Now that looks um, uh, that looks pretty good. 97% of the North Korean road network covered if you're using both the penetrating UAVs and the standoff UAVs. Again, excellent capability. There are all kinds of issues about penetrating UAVs. Can they survive against North Korean air defenses? And it, there's an issue about whether or not they can detect targets out of the blue as opposed to being cued to them and then going to identify them. But again, that's just another part of the analysis that you can go down that road. So back to the final issue, right? Hardening concealment being dramatically undermined by the accuracy revolution seem to be undermined by sensing revolution. And I think we're talking about implications of all of this. This is the final slide. Um, I like to start with nuclear force structure. Right? What should the United States do? What should other countries do? Um, if you believe our analysis, there's a growing vulnerability of land-based forces. Certainly when it comes to fixed land-based forces like silos and even mobile land-based targets because the remote sensing revolution appear to be getting quite vulnerable. You might then say, okay, well fine, let's not build ICBMs. And the United States doesn't have any road mobile ICBMs. I, I wouldn't mind kind of having them instead of the fixed silos. But okay, let's just go with submarines. In a way, submarines are more secure, but they also have great operational limitations and in, and in many ways growing vulnerability of subs at sea. In the, in the article, if you're interested, you can uh, see this further. We have a couple sections that discuss the growing vulnerability of submarines at sea, um, which is largely, again, due to the remote sensing, um, uh, persistent sensing, uh, artificial intelligence, and, uh, big data, all kinds of things that are, are making the seas more transparent um, than you might have ever have imagined they would be. So difficult choices about what kinds of capabilities to build in light of the counterforce revolution. That's for survivability, but what about for offense, right? What capabilities are desirable, especially for the most likely challenge of intra-war deterrence? How do you deter North Korea from escalating to nuclear use in the midst of a conventional war? Presumably having the ability to disarm them if they begin to escalate might give you some deterrent benefit. And if the terms fails and they start using them anyways, then you want to do damage limitation, right? I like to call it mitigation. You're going to mitigate the problem by destroying as much of their arsenal as you can before it gets used. All kinds of different regional implications, again, depending on where we've, um, we've given this talk. As, as I said, in Russia and China, um, Korea, Israel, um, all over the US, and in Europe, um, we emphasize different things. But it's not hard to imagine different kinds of deterrence and stability. I've mainly talked about the US North Korea scenario, but in, in many ways, the U.S.-Russia relationship and, and the, in the, just in the last five, ten years, the kind of level of um, tension and analysis of deterrence instability between NATO and, 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 and Russia, I almost said the Soviet Union, but I did, and Russia is kind of amazing. And then finally, arms control. Um, we're working on a piece for foreign affairs on this, which is, I, I think arms control is dead, nuclear arms control. Um, there might be multiple reasons for that, but I think the most important one is why would any, any country concerned about the vulnerability of its arsenals agree to reduce numbers? In a world in which conventional is now becoming counterforce capable, which submarines are becoming counterforce capable, uh, in fact, arms cuts. Those, those are the efforts that might be undermining stability more than anything else in the world. Take questions on anything, uh, uh, whether related to this or really anything, I'm happy to discuss. Yes. Uh, thank you, Zach, for, right? the, yes. for the presentation. What impact do you see the factors that you listed, particularly uh, accuracy and variable yields, airburst reducing casualties, what impact do you see that having on the nuclear taboo? 
And do you think that it indicates that nuclear weapons are moving into a paradigm where they have utility beyond deterrence, perhaps as a first strike? Yeah, great question. In fact, it's been in the news. Um, I get the you know defense news and all the articles, and every now and then over the last six months, there's been something that'll say, Pentagon considering building, you know, uh, considering mini nukes uh, um, in the nuclear posture view. And usually it goes on because they've interviewed someone like um, Joe Cerencioni or some other arms control nonproliferation person. It goes on to say this is a worrisome development. It'll undermine the nuclear taboo. It'll make nuclear weapons more usable. Okay, my first reaction is. Um, I don't know which is first or not, but one reaction is, we already have mini-nukes. Call them tactical nukes, mini-nukes, 0.3 kilotons. That's what we're talking about. So the, the notion that we're somehow building new nuclear weapons is completely false. What we're talking about is replacing the aging systems. We're replacing the entire triad. So there's a debate about the new Alcom, the new cruise missile. The B-61 has been uh, upgraded to LEP, Life Extension Program for the B-61. We already have those capabilities. I find it strange and I find it just politically driven to try to create this image that we don't already have those capabilities. The second thing, reaction, is about the usability. Well, okay, I, I thought nuclear weapons work because they're usable. That's what makes them credible. If I, if I want to deter you from using nuclear weapons, I need you to believe that I will use nuclear weapons if you use them against me. Or that if you begin to reach for your nuclear sword, that I'm going to shoot that out of your hand. I, I thought that was the whole point. The whole thing about credibility in the Cold War, right? Again, many of you are too young to remember this, but we had a huge problem with credibility in the Cold War, which is that we were committed to defend Western Europe from a NATO invasion, a NATO conventional invasion. And what we had to do was convince the Soviet Union that we were going to use nukes, because if we didn't use nukes, Western Europe was going to be overrun. But the problem was, it was a problem of credibility. How do we threaten to use nuclear weapons if they could hit us back? Are we really going to, you know, surrender? We're going to have new, uh, what's, trade bond for, you know, New York, et cetera. How do we make that credible? And what we did was we spread tactical nuclear weapons all over Western Europe. We pre-delegated authority in some cases. We, um, you know, we made it so that we created tripwires, uh, all kinds of things that would almost inevitably lead to nuclear use. So I thought that was the whole point. If the question is, is a commander, is the US president going to be more likely to use nuclear weapons um, if he's not, he or she is not going to kill millions of people because we have that capability? I, 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 don't, I don't understand that. I mean, military planners are supposed to give the US president options. And you know, your own preference that you would rather risk the consequences of not launching a counterforce attack against millions of dead, you don't want the option to have killing far fewer, that's your choice. But that's not, I don't think that's responsible leadership or policy on ours. I do understand you want to take into consideration the, the, the reaction of adversaries, and that might leave you worse off if you develop new and more capable kinds of weapons. But that's just a debate that we should be having, not whether or not you know, they're more usable. But he's uh, passionate about that question. So, um, thank you as well for the presentation. Oh, sure. I have a question. The scenario you used the hypothetical with China. Um, I would assume if that were to ever come about, that the beginning of that conflict would ultimately take place in cyberspace. And if you considered, for example, how cyber might affect the reliability then of launching, you know, in terms of control systems and um, radar systems, if they're able to get into those, did you consider that? And if you did, what? What did you, what conclusions did you make? Yeah, so there's a difference between considering and incorporating in your analysis, right? At some point, you have to stop somewhere. So we didn't do unintended ground sensors, but at the same time, we didn't, you know, model uh, attacks on U.S. command and control. By the way, how about ASAT uh, um, operations to degrade our GPS? Um, in other words, anti-satellite efforts. There's all kinds of, in a real world scenario, there'd be all kinds of things you want to take into consideration. What we kept finding was that, yeah, we, are, we understand that, the United States understands that, and that's why we're spending a lot of money and effort to develop anti-ASAT capabilities, why we're spending a lot of money to try and protect our command and control, why we're spending a lot of money on cyber, electronic warfare, et cetera. The point is, I mean, what, what's, what, what, I, what I would emphasize, and pulling back from all of those different factors, is that this is a game, it's a competition, and then of course there's a reaction, and there's a reaction to that reaction, and that's what we've been seeing. 
But if you grew up in the Cold War and you grew up in the last couple decades and were trained in nuclear weapons at most academic establishments or even in the in the government, you might have faith that nuclear weapons, you know, end the game, end the competition, right? Especially once two sides have robust arsenals. That deterrence is strong. This is the meaning of the nuclear revolution. You don't need to engage in all this kind of competition. And nobody is behaving that way, right? The, the reason, as our book goes on to explain, is that it's a problem with the theory of the nuclear revolution. It's not a problem with people and leaders and individuals because they understand how to balance off the desire to develop counterforce capabilities and protect your own arsenal. Is it constantly moving one? In a real North Korean mitigation campaign where they've threatened or actually begun to undertake nuclear use as a form of escalation, there's no question we're going to be doing cyber, we're going to be doing everything that we can do to make it so they can't use it, not just solely using nuclear weapons against theirs or conventional weapons. Um, so it's a really, it's a rich kind of uh, picture. Nowhere have we encountered arguments that, um, on the technical side of it, to suggest that we're wrong about what we've modeled, okay? Um, typical arguments you get in response are things like, yeah, but no U.S. president would ever use a nuclear weapon, okay? Um, that's not what the Chinese believe, it's not what the Russians believe, it's not what our adversaries believe. Um, and, you know, other kinds of critiques about the implications for stability, but not on the technical details of the things that we have modeled. Um, the next, next uh, similar project that we're undertaking um, will be actually a better analysis of what you can do with conventional versus nuclear. I mean, we're, we're not about to go down the cyber road, and, and, and partly due to classification issues, you know. Someone over the Pentagon wants to tell me we're just going to turn off North Korean nukes? Okay, good. I don't believe it. I'd be happy if you're right, but there's no way I, as an academic on the outside, am going to do an analysis. I think that would be all that useful. I, I can just tell you right now, yeah. we're not. What's that? We're not. I'll just tell you. Yeah, we're, we're not. We're, we're not going to turn them off. We're not going to be able to turn them off. We're not going to turn them Well, uh, you figure out why. I'm just going to say we probably won't. Okay. All right. Here, here, just to pick up on yes, what sir. you just said, I mean, all of what you've said about improved accuracy and so forth applies to conventional weapons as well as nuclear. For sure. So at some point, instead of having trade-offs across nuclear weapons, and you know, you start to have conventional nuclear trade-offs. Yeah. Yeah. What the analysis is going to do is look and see can can conventional do everything that nuclear can do? Yeah. That, That's that the question be. that most people want to know. Yeah. Right. Right now, I mean. Right now, we're, I mean, we're getting close. I just don't know how to, um, I don't think we're there yet, and I don't think even if you could do it on paper that shows that conventional can do everything nukes can do, you're still gonna want nuclear weapons. Um, well, I, I mean, again, my, my view of that, um, uh, for all, a variety of different reasons, but I'm interested in just the, of what the analysis will show. Mm -hmm. um, and and um, yeah, that's the, that's the next project. Smart to really take on directorship of SSP if I really want to get all this new research done, but that's another story. <laughs> Come on, yes. Uh, sir, Brian Meehan, I'm a first semester um, SSP student. Uh, I've heard electronic warfare officers speak in a pretty alarmist manner about um, adversary EW capabilities, and you mentioned it a minute ago, but the, the possibility they could interfere with or completely disable our GPS guidance systems. Also, um, adversaries putting a lot more money than, uh, a lot more money into A2AD capabilities um, to try to counter our uh, you know, GMTI and, um, and the unmanned systems. Uh, is there a way, it might be tough to talk about at the young class level, but is there a way to model that? Do we know exactly what their capabilities are? Do you think we do? Um, how, the question is, how, you know, how would you go about modeling, analyzing, especially open source, electronic warfare? Um, I don't know. Do you have, do you, do you have any thoughts? Well, my, my thoughts are just that um, it seems to me, you know, I, I'm an Army officer, so I, I've only operated, you know, on the ground at a tactical level. So this is, you know, much higher than mm -hmm. my um, wheelhouse. But mm -hmm. we are lacking in EW capabilities at the tactical level. I, I hope that we have better capabilities at the operational strategic levels, but I, I, don't, I don't see that from my point of view. So I, I feel like we should be doing more. I, I understand. Um, who was, I'm trying to remember. Um, um, one of our students who is in the PhD program, uh, I think is interested in doing it in a military um, uh, uh, candidate, PhD, 
uh, doing an analysis of, you know, that the Marines need to have certain kinds of capabilities, you know, that, for example, using drones in tactical, uh, uh, tactical ways that are just not available right now. And they're trying to explain why is it that the Marines, you know, Navy and, and others have not kind of uh, taken advantage of this. Um, I imagine some of the same similar uh, challenges. Um, I, I just uh, it's, it's, uh, it's above my pay grade even more than it is above your, your pay grade. Okay, that's Scott Como. Scott Yeah, it might be Scott, that's right. Yeah, thank you. Yes, oh, yes. Yeah, I'm from South Korea. Okay. Uh, many South Korean citizens think that the North Korea Kim Jong-un will not use the nuclear weapon to South Korea because uh, Kim Jong-un is not an idiot, so he won't, <laughs> he won't use or contaminate his territory in the future like mm -hmm. that. But uh, as you mentioned, if nuclear war had exploded on the air, not the ground, right. it means that Kim Jong-un attack, nuclear attack possibility increase because it decreased the contamination, right? Decrease yeah, okay. Um, but What's that? So, I, look. Here's the thing about the North Korea nuclear escalation scenario. This is um, this is not some this this is a scenario that, that should not be just pushed off to some annex of disturbing things that might happen. I think the baseline expectation should be that if a conventional war breaks out in the Korean Peninsula, North Korea is going to use a nuclear weapon. Okay. And the reason I think that is it, it's about the kind of nuclear use that they're going to do. They're not. I don't believe going to reach out and hit Seoul with a nuclear weapon, or even Tokyo, maybe not even Kadena Air Force Base, right? The goal of nuclear escalation in a conventional war is to stop the war before it's too late, okay? Before the conventional balance of power results in a, in a massive, you know, a, a, a decisive, if this is just a conventional conflict, yes, we can talk about the artillery threat to Seoul, et cetera, but this is a war that's gonna end badly for Pyongyang, and it's gonna result in South, if Combined Forces Command march, you know, driving up, to, to, to Pyongyang. And the North Koreans are not idiots. They are rational. I think Kim is rational. And I think Kim understands perfectly well what happened to Gaddafi and what happened to Saddam Hussein. Um, you know, again, they're not around to testify about what happened, but we all saw it on TV. We all understand what happened. If you look at, the, at every major U.S. military operation since the end of the Cold War, and you, you're not going to be able to ask the leader of that country what happened because they're either in jail or died in jail or, you know, hung on the gallows or pulled from a covert and beaten to death. This is an existential crisis for a country like North Korea fighting. And in those circumstances, the logic would be to use something that's provocative enough, but that signals that they could do more unless Combined Forces Command halt, cease military operations, compel, coerce a stalemate before it's too late. And if you don't think that that's, a, that's not a rational strategy, and by the way, they could detonate one on their own territory, or maybe over the Sea of Japan, or as I was corrected um, when I gave a briefing at the, the, yeah, the uh, um, uh, Korean, to a, the Korean Chiefs of Staff uh, General, he, he stopped me and said, go back to slide six, you know, EC, <laughs> instead of Sea of Japan. Uh, you know, I just constantly have to, it's like hard to edit it, that slide. It's, yeah. <laughs> So anyway, it could be that. It could be hitting a ship in the, in, in the East Sea. It could be hitting Kadena or somewhere on Okinawa. It could be a, a Japanese city, right? Which, again, wasn't seen as escalatory as much from the Korean side. But anyway, the point is, it's what's to come. And if you think it's irrational, put yourself in the shoes of the United States or South Korea. What, what would you do, right? Here, here's, here are your options, right? They've begun to escalate. You either accept a ceasefire. You know what? This has gone way too far. You're right. We don't, you know, we don't want to continue this. A nuclear war start. We didn't want that. That's got a significant downside. You know, first of all, it's going to set a dangerous precedent. You know, an adversary just uses one nuclear weapon in a demonstrative role, and the United States caves. You know, there goes the nuclear umbrella. Um, and guess what? All your adversaries are going to want more nukes, and your allies are going to want nukes too. You might. On the other hand, you know, depending on the crowd that we play this out for, oh hell no, we're going to turn Pyongyang to glass, right? They just use a nuclear weapon, and he, maybe if it killed U.S. soldiers in particular, forget about it. We're going to pulverize Pyongyang with nuclear weapons, right? We're going to go after the leadership. We're going to continue, continue to fight the conventional war, um, and we're going to hope the missile defense helps us deal with any remaining uh, uh, North Korean use. You know, the downside there is you're going to kill millions of people, especially if those leadership targets in Pyongyang are in Pyongyang. And 
you know, there's no guarantee that even doing that is going to prevent North Korea from using weapons two through ten. If, if Kim is given the order that if you don't get a call for, if, if I can't reach you, you know, use those weapons, you've got a big problem on your hands. Maybe third option, you ignore it. You ignore that signaling and that first initial use, and you say, well, they're not going to hit, you know, a, a major target. So you continue to march on Pyongyang. You rely on missile defense if they start to use nuclear weapons, but. You know, our allies aren't going to like that. My guess is our South Korean friends are not going to like this because you're risking, you know, them doing what they say they're going to do or continuing to go up the escalation ladder, um, and, you know, goodbye to the East Asian Alliance Network. And then finally, and if you guys come up with other options, that'd be great. I'll later admit, I think this pretty much covers it, but you can do counterforce. <coughs> try to disarm uh, uh, North Korea. And that could be nuclear, it could be conventional, but of course you might not get them all, and that's the issue that we're dealing with right here. And if it's a nuclear strike, you might kill many non-combatants. Typically, people rotate, you know, the, the, I've talked to you between accepting a ceasefire and doing counterforce, but this all turns on whether or not you have the capabilities um, to do counterforce. And if that's the world that you think you're gonna be in, that a conventional war is gonna escalate to the nuclear level, I think it's quite plausible. Nobody thinks that a conventional war on the Korean Peninsula is like implausible. If it's conventional, huge incentives to go nuclear, and then you're faced with this choice, and we better prepare for this right now. You want to come up with some other strategy, you know, maybe we want to make clear to the South Koreans that we can't protect them, you know, that's fine. We probably want to have that out in the open, with at least behind closed doors with them, um, and we might want to build the capability to do counterforce, because I don't see any other, I don't see any other option. That was a long answer, but you see I'm ready for it. <laughs> Three different scenarios out there dealing with missile defense, and you spoke a little bit about using conventional. I guess this is on the back half of the first strike, but I mean that gets a lot of press. ABM was popular at the end of the Bush yeah. era in Eastern Europe. Where do you see that progressing investment in those areas? Yeah, it can't hurt, right? I mean, again, it's a flip way to, to respond. We, I mean, um, missile defense is a key component of a counterforce strike. Again, this is people who say, oh, offense, defense, missile defense shouldn't worry China, shouldn't worry. You know, that's not the message you get when you go to Beijing, right? They see missile defense as an off part of an offensive strategy of the United States. That if we launch a counterforce strike against China, for example, that our missile defense capabilities are going to be useful in a mop-up role against those remaining forces. It's not an issue of using missile defense to stop 200, you know, uh, uh, Chinese uh, missiles. It's to stop, you know, one, two, six, maybe. And, it, and the, the answer to what missile defense do is it's an open question, and we can analyze it, and people can analyze it. Again, we haven't done it. We thought about um, interlaying the, the missile defense um, component into this article, but it was already one of the longer um, pieces that they would uh, that they would um, likely run. Um, but there's a good reason why nuclear adversaries in the U.S. are um, worried about our missile defense capabilities, which is cute to me that we probably want to keep building them. And, and, and that they're useful for that dark times if we ever have to actually do counterforce. Yeah? Do you have a maximum number of nuclear warheads or nuclear weapons in mind to counter defense you described and to maintain the current? Uh, no, no I, do, I don't. Um, numbers, so since the day I came back to Washington in 2009, and even well before that because we were working on nuclear issues, you know, constantly pressed to, what's the right number of nuclear weapons that should have. Is it 1,000 enough? Is it 1,500? Do we need you know, uh, 5,000 uh, strategically deployed? I can't, I can't answer that question. It's about what capabilities. What's the mission? And then, I can, and then I can do an analysis and tell you what I think we need. But who's the adversary? Um, even if you choose the biggest adversary out there, um, you have to make decisions about which kind of capabilities you want and use. So it's far more important to me, for example, that we retain the air-breathing leg of the triad because people talk about getting rid of, of bombers and, 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 and I want to keep them because it's got these low-yield capabilities. Um, I, when we build the new submarine launch ballistic missiles or even the new uh, uh, silo missiles, I'd like it to have a primary only option, an option where you know, in a two-stage thermonuclear weapon, you basically have one nuke that goes off to create enough um, uh, heat to compress um, uh, uh, your um, your fuel to create a fusion thermonuclear detonation, and the idea is that you can 
you can do it so just the primary goes off and not doesn't trigger the, the full thermonuclear explosion. That's a difference between very high yields and very small yields, small yields. Um, it's not difficult to do, but you have to just make the decision about whether you're going to have that option or not. So those are options about capabilities, not about numbers. Um, but I, I think at a certain point you do get too low. I think we're, we're, getting, we're getting close. For most of the missions, just for my analysis, when I started assigning four you know, warheads on a, on a single target, even if they're low yield and even if they're not going to kill millions of people, you, know, you start to run out of those, those munitions, um, depending on the target set. So I refuse to be pinned to numbers. I don't want to be on anybody's side on that one. Yeah. Uh, mentioning capabilities, who else has the capabilities to have these many options yeah. as us? Because it, as you said, you don't even know if Russia can do it as good as we're doing it. So who else is able to say, oh, we have all of these options. We don't just have the option of just dropping them off. Yeah, well, uh, rather than say who, again, what's the, if you're asking who has SAR satellites, lots of countries. If you're saying, you know, who has the accuracy, a lot, of, a lot of countries. Um, the thing that I look to is what are what are those countries pushing for? What are they developing? And the Russians and the Chinese are deeply interested in act, improving the accuracy of their nuclear weapons, right? They're interested, in, of course, on the defense survivability side, how to how to make their submarines silent. Right? This is China's big problem. They do not have a triad, right? I mean, the, those submarines, those boomers are are still. I think big fat targets. Is it changing? Are we deeply worried about those capabilities? Of course. But um, you look at India and Pakistan and the things that each one of them are pursuing, the counterforce and, and response to counterforce. Um, yeah, they're, they're marching down that path, no question about it. And, and again, the United States is at the vanguard. We are still, you know, I would argue, uh, at the forefront of most of these capabilities, but our, our adversaries and non-adversaries are, are not standing still either. Again, so we could decide to just you know, not go down this path, but that doesn't change the global development that I think we're, we're really trying to, to emphasize. Yeah, Tom. Yeah. So, so uh, we, we're entering the nuclear posture review. Do you think we're, I mean, you could imagine super deep silos or mini submarines that multiply that target set, you know, ways to, to uh, counter the accuracy revolution. Yeah. Uh, are those live options, or are we pretty much, you know, sort of marching toward a new minute man in the same old silos, Ohio replacement, maybe fewer tubes, but you know, yeah. basically the same number of submarines, maybe even fewer. Uh, yeah, you have any sense of the range of options we have to just stabilize the force? So yeah. Your yeah. incentives to go nuclear, at yeah. least on our end, go down. Yeah, I, um, uh, from what I understand here, and what I understand, um, you're not going to see any dramatic changes in the, you know, the Obama modernization is going to replace each of the major components, including the new cruise missile. Um, uh, that's that's going to be a target still of kind of the arms control community. We don't need this cruise missile, et cetera, but it, I don't, I think that that's going to stay. At one point I had heard um, discussions of the new road mobile option for the United States. And actually it's an interesting analysis. If you just, um, again, this is just for the, you know, uh, what is it? Uh, inside baseball or in the weeds kind of thing, but you'd almost rather have road mobile missiles than an ICBM force. Um, it, and, and there are even are good arguments about why it's even safer. You know, we already take missiles and take them out of the silo and drive them around the country in the back of big, you know, uh, uh, trucks. Um, how is that any safer than actually a tell that's, you know, really trained to do this? By the way, you give that mission to the Army, right? They know how to fire missiles and, you know, move around the, the, uh, the countryside. Um, it's arguably be cheaper. Um, there are a lot of good good reasons, but but that may have, I think that's pretty much out. We we tried that, remember? Well, the original yeah, 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 wasn't yeah. terribly popular. Well, right. Um, this is a new day. Tom, yeah. Come yeah. on, uh, <laughs> better roads. War. <laughs> right, right. Better roads. Um, jobs. Uh, yeah. I think that the um, changes I, I think are going to be that there might be a primary only option on on, on some of the new missiles. Um, uh, but no, nothing big and dramatic. And again, that's partly because I, I think that we are looking more toward the opportunities rather than the vulnerabilities and the risks um, um, to the U.S. force. I mean, you know, is the pure ICBM, do you need an ICBM force? You know, is it vulnerable? You know, the arguments you used to make is that it's useful because it's a sink for all the Russian missiles. They'd have to use so many against our targets. We don't really have that argument uh, around. It's not as compelling anymore. So again, I think that the bigger changes are about what we can do 
for counterforce, not about our survivability of our, um, our weapons. But that's certainly not the case for others. Uh, it depends on the context, it depends on the adversaries that are involved. Yeah. So <clears throat> we talked about ground bursts and air bursts. In your research, did you examine the utility or the implications as far as fallout and casualties are concerned for high altitude EMP strikes? We did not do EMP, but that wouldn't be about, um, well, I guess it would be about casualties, but the casualties would be far more minimum than, you know, far fewer than a, than a, a, a ground burst that creates nuclear fallout. I mean, because presumably you're, what would go down, what would happen if you completely lost your electrical grid and, you know, I mean, people wouldn't be able to get to the hospital in time, that kind of thing. Um, but I got also I don't want to I don't want to minimize it um, when people talk about cyber attacks it can have real kind of effects I get it but not compared to a nuclear weapons you know creating fallout which kills millions of people I just don't think it's um I don't think it's comparable anybody who hasn't seen it um, nuke map 3D um, uh, um, Alex Wellerstein has got a online tool that you can use to model you know, um, uh, hypothetical strikes against anywhere in the world. You know, it's tied in with Google Maps, and it, you pick out DC, you pick out the location, you pick out you know ground zero, you pick out the yield, you pick out the air burst, ground burst, and you click which boxes you want to see about casualties and, and, and fallout and all the rest. Um, I gave him a bunch of advice on, on different things that I wanted to see in the in the thing too, and he, he's amazing. He was able to get everything in there, so. You can see for yourself the damage there. I don't know if there's an EMP burst function in there. There might be. So you, you can model it and find out. But yeah. And again, the argument about EMP and whether it's a problem or not is not based on how many people will kill. It's simply like it might be more usable by an adversary because it doesn't kill, but yet does significant damage, does signal, does undermine our ability to do counterforce and things like that. Do you think that's a, a useful part of a counterforce strike? From an uh, I don't. I you know I haven't thought about it. I don't. I'm probably not. Uh, I'm <clears throat> count me as sort of a skeptic on the EMP thing. Um, but uh, again, I know enough to know. I don't. I don't know um, for sure. Not to take a stance, but I think it would be cause kind of problems for our own uh, forces operating in the area. Um, and we think a lot about jamming devices, jamming of our GPS. But we we do spend a lot of time and energy on anti-jamming and. Um, you know, it's one more component. Again, I hope everybody in the Pentagon is focusing on this. It's not just, you know, two professors in the ivory tower being able to do this kind of analysis. I assume they could do it better than I could do it, but I don't know. You know what happens when you assume. Yeah. Hey. Um, do you think there's any um, deterrent uh, value to us as the United States investing in systems that um, attack systems uh, of the enemy that are like prerequisites for their nuclear capability. So in other words, like could that be a credible deterrent as well, other than just targeting their actual nuclear systems, but targeting the things that support those nuclear systems? You mean like command and control? Yeah. There's no question that we were, I mean, there's no question that we are, whether they like, you know, whether it matters for them or not, we're, we're, we care deeply about that option and being able to do that. Um, with North Korea, it's a little more complicated just because of the, what we assume is a pretty primitive kind of command and control relationship, which might have re resulted in pre-delegation or orders going out. Um, but you know, for example, my I I, I, uh, I have a strong I would bet that we are doing our best to plan to communicate with North Korean commanders in the field in the event of a war to say you know if this is on your shoulders if you you know if you get an order to use your nuclear weapon or do something that we otherwise don't want you know. Don't do it, and we won't put you on the gallows. But if you do, then you're you know you're responsible for that. So we're we're trying to do different ways to address that issue and to be able to detect stuff through SIGINT and human intelligence and, and other things. Um, uh, so there's no question that's another component of what we'd be doing. I, again, I don't know about the answer that we wouldn't do cyber. I, I didn't know quite how to read that. Um, I mean, we're going to do whatever we can to stop them from being able to escalate. And that might be going after command and control. It will be going after command and control. It will be going after the actual forces if they're about to be used. Going after storage sites. It'll be going after leadership targets. It'll be kind of everything that we do, American way of war. You know, I, it occurs to me there are times when I'm glad I'm old. 
<laughs> I'll, I'll leave these problems to you. <laughs> I'll move to northern Vermont and grow vegetables. Anyway, here, this is fabulous. And this, this is the future. This is what we're going to be thinking about, what you're going to think about if you go into this business, because this is where the technology is driving. So I really appreciate it.